I was right. So yesterday on the channel, I put out a video called I Was Wrong, which went into detail onto uh, some very important subjects that I just got, to be quite frank, wrong over the past year. And we went and dug in and why certain things happen that I never saw coming over the past year, right? And in today's video, we're going to get into the things I've gotten right over the past year and um, why those certain things transpired. And I think these two videos, this is like a two video series I have, which is the I Was Wrong video. And then this one, I Was Right, right? which is going to go into essentially like why these things happen. Why did I get certain things right in the market? Why did I get certain things wrong? And yesterday was obviously the wrong video. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Hope you get some good value out of it. And uh, yeah, I kind of look at these as kind of like a little educational mini series I have of, of two videos here. One thing I didn't cover yesterday that I wish, I wish I had gotten right is I wish I went into this year more cash heavy and I wish it was with Wealthfront through their cash account. But unfortunately, I didn't know about Wealthfront's cash account last year. So it is what it is. Okay. Alrighty guys. So let's get into this and um, talk about a few of these things. Okay. First thing up here. So if you didn't know, we used to have the channel Millennial Money. It was uh, Kevin, Andre, Graham and, and myself and you know, a lot of fun on that channel and we had some, some good time. Completely random fun fact I forgot to mention here. You see that this is where it says for all business inquiries, please email Erica at EricaColberg.com. It just cracks me up because Erica, she used to help us out and uh, she ended up actually becoming the biggest finance creator literally in the world. It's on there, okay? And one thing I, it became almost like a running joke uh, with me on the channel is uh, how long till I brought up the middle class. And, uh, you know, going into the end of 2021 and into this year, 2022, my biggest concern was the middle class. I had very big concerns about the state of the middle class and what was going to transpire in the middle class. And I was very afraid of using, and I use this term many times, of the middle class kind of being sliced and diced. Uh, because of inflation, essentially, right? Which, by the way, inflation got up to even higher numbers than I had anticipated. So I was already very concerned with what is going to happen in the middle class in 2022. And things got even worse than I thought, which n almost no one was even talking about this or addressing this. You know, most politicians looked at this as, oh, the middle class is so strong. You know, things are going great. And uh, I was just looking at it and I'm like, I see the middle class getting sliced and diced very, very bad. And in terms of this prediction, it was 100% accurate. Look at this. This came out this past week. 66% of American workers are worse off financially than a year ago due to inflation, right? What should happen over time is American workers should be in a better place financially year after year after year. When you got, you know, 66%, the far majority of American workers doing worse, that means inflation just sliced and diced them left and right. Even this is startling. Look at this down here. Nearly one in three workers, including those earning more than $100,000, run out of money before payday. Come on, man. you got to be kidding me. And nearly one out of three making more than 100000 I remember when I, I, back in the day, like, you know, when I was working at Quick Trip making like 50000 a year, I just remember thinking about the illustrious $100,000 a year. And I was like, man, I, like if I could ever make $100,000, that would be like the dream, right? And um, obviously, I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I surpassed that, right? But the fact that my dream of making $100,000 or more a year is now in a situation where one in three workers, that's not even enough money, and, and they're running out of money before payday, that's crazy to think about, right? So that prediction, on, I wish it was wrong. Like that's one of those predictions I wish that never came true. And I wish I was like, oh man, the middle class is doing so great. They're doing better than ever. I wish I was wrong about that. I'll just be quite clear because that's, um, you know, like, like the middle class runs the economy. That's just a bottom line. And if the middle class is not in a healthy space, it ends up hurting the entire economy. It hurts all companies' earnings. It hurts, you know, it's, it affects everything. Because that's the masses, like that's who spends all the money out there. You got, you got, you know, obviously a certain amount of people that are in poverty, but those folks aren't the big spenders out there, right? Then you got the the wealthy, you know, the, the super wealthy folks, right? The folks that make five hundred thousand plus a year, but it's a very small amount of the population. So if you're talking about who's really running the economy, it's the middle class. And so if the middle class is not in a healthy place, the American economy is not in a healthy place. Never forget that, okay? And so that was definitely a prediction I was 100% I was spot on there, okay? Next one up here, 
If you know me, you know I always preach to keep an emergency fund around, especially in uncertain times like we're in right now. But the question is, where do you keep that cash? I certainly know where some people keep it. They keep it right under the mattress. Oh, here's another idea. What about in the hidden compartment of your Tesla? Ooh. Oh, and we can't forget everybody's favorite. Oh, in the freezer. Oh, you know what? Thinking about it, no. Those are certainly options, but uh, I don't think they're very good ones. I have come across a great one recently, and that is this segment of the video sponsor, which is Wealthfront. Wealthfront allows you to get 2.55% APY on all your cash without having to jump through hoops, meet high minimums, referrals, etc. Everyone gets this offer. If let's say you had 50K in a Wealthfront cash account at 2.55% APY, that would yield just over $1,200 per year year. You gotta be flipping my flapjacks. And it's FDIC insured up to $1 million through partner banks. With Wealthfront, there's no pesky account fees like others charge you. You can create custom savings categories and track your progress on a down payment, travel fund, etc. You can easily move money around, including into your Wealthfront investment account, so you continue to build your wealth. Start earning interest today by going to Wealthfront.com slash financial education and taking advantage of this rare opportunity. The link will also be first link in the description. It will also be pinned comment down there is crypto valuations. So obviously there was a lot of pressure on me uh, a year ago to get into crypto, right? A lot of pressure on me. You know, I heard it from just about everybody who's everybody. And uh, yeah, man, you need to buy Bitcoin, you need to buy Ethereum, you need to buy this, that, right? And obviously over the past year, those things have done you know, pretty bad, right? Ethereum's down 67%, Bitcoin's down 69%, uh, ADA uh, is down 83%, Solana's down 86.5% over the uh, past year, and who knows, you know, where, where crypto will go from, from here, essentially, right? But when I just looked at the crypto market, you know, I, I looked at a market that it didn't make sense in regards to how do you value these things? And that was the point I always brought up, right? It's not that I'm negative on Bitcoin or Ethereum long term. I actually think there's a place, a great place for Bitcoin over the next, you know, 10, 20 years. I think if I, I'm actually a believer in Ethereum over the next 10, 20 years. It really comes down to how do you value these things? And the fact is, that if you go back a year ago, Bitcoin was valued, I believe, over a trillion dollars. And it's like, what is, why should Bitcoin be valued over a trillion dollars, right? Ethereum was valued at some, you know, pretty insane numbers in all these different crypto projects, you know, like, you know, valuations are thrown up. They're all valued at a billion, 10 billion, 20 billion, 50 billion. And it's just like, why should it be that? So it it was never that I was negative on crypto. It's just I didn't know how to value these things, right? Now, I still got kind of screwed in the whole crypto situation because I, I bought a crypto brokerage that went under, right? And so I still ended up losing money. The, the fortunate thing is I lost a very small amount of money compared to if I was full go into crypto because, um, you know, obviously I would have bought with very substantial amounts of money. Let's just put it that way. But th that was just me with my, my opinion in crypto. It's like, at the end of the day, does a valuation make sense on an asset? And I just can't, I, I, I don't know how to value crypto yet. Maybe, if, you know, a few years from now is a different situation. I'm like, here's why it deserves to be valued at a hundred billion dollars or da, da, da. Right now, I can't say that when it comes to crypto. Okay. Number three is China stocks. I've stayed away from those stocks and I've been, uh, you know, a pretty strong advocate uh, to being very careful with China stocks, right? Despite valuations looking extremely compelling on, on, especially on a stock like Alibaba. Valuation says, buy me, buy me, buy me over the past year. But at the end of the day, you can't trust these stocks. Alibaba is down 64% in the past year. Neo stock is down 77%. All the Chinese stocks are down massively. I just brought out those because those are the most popular ones that everybody talks about. Alibaba and Neo, right? And uh, both of them have just been, you know, to be quite frank, uh, obliterated. And that's despite Alibaba specifically's valuation looking extremely compelling. And that being a great business model, it really is. Like, Baba's a great business. But at the end of the day, there's big problems between the United States and China. Secondly, there's big problems in China. Third, there's big problems with investing in Chinese-related stocks. And the reason there's big problems there is when you buy a Chinese stock, you're buying the hope that maybe you can own that Chinese stock. But really, you're buying many times in relation to buying these Chinese stocks, you're buying a shell corporation out on some island somewhere that is supposed to represent ownership somehow in this mainland China stock. But how can you trust that? How can you trust that? You can't. You can't trust that, unfortunately. And um, it sucks 
because some of those Chinese companies are really good companies, but you can't trust the situation because of the way the Chinese government does everything over there. So uh, say no to Chinese stocks. It's a hard decision because it looks compelling, but it's just it's it's not the way, unfortunately. And, and the worst part with these is you don't know if they're necessarily going to zero just because they might get delisted who's to say China government's not just going to take over these companies? Like, you know, so many scares with that. Okay. So that's the third thing up there. Okay. Number four is no to large caps and big techs in, in, you know, it was, it was interesting. I almost become, became branded toward the end of last year and obviously the beginning of this year as a small cap guy because all the stocks I was buying were small caps, right? And the reason that happened is not because all of a sudden I wanted to become the small cap investor. It's because that's where valuations actually were extremely compelling. I mean, if you look at small caps going, you know, at the end of last year, going into this year, you were trading at valuations that were, you know, among the lowest you've had in the last several decades, and when it came to large caps, they were trading at among the highest valuations we've seen in the past decade, right? And uh, if not several decades, I mean, you have to go all the way back to the tech bubble days to find large caps trading at that. So that made me not feel comfortable about buying big tech stocks or large cap stocks a year ago. I just did not feel comfortable. And, and I saw those as being a big risk, right? The thing I did not see coming was small caps pushing down to even lower valuations. I mean, you know, small caps basically pushed down to valuations, you know, basically we've never we've never seen outside of 08. Outside of 08, we've never seen small caps trade at down, you know, where they were trading at the lows. I mean, it's still insanely low at 11.4, but at one point it was in the 10s. So that was a thing I never saw coming. But um, I was 100% right to stay away from large caps. And this is just something important to pay attention to in the future. Forward P's. Pay attention to forward P's in the future because they're going to let you know roughly where the opportunities are in the market, right? And small caps were a huge opportunity going into this year. They're just a much bigger opportunity now. You know, when it, whenever it comes to stocks, the important thing to remember is they can't stay at unsustainably low prices or high prices for very long. It can last a bit, right? If you look at this, you know, large caps trade at very high valuations for about a year, for about a year. And um, eventually, what had to happen? The correction had to come, right? They had to be priced more in line with where they should be priced, right? And so with small caps, they've been trading disgustingly cheap for about a year. There's going to be a major correction in small caps that takes these stocks much up, let's just call it that, into normal where it should be in kind of like the 16 range. The, the big question is, when does this happen? Does it happen now? Does it happen in three months, six months, 12 months? It's going to happen. I can promise you that. You don't stay trading at unsustainably low or high valuations for very long. It can last maybe a year or so, and then it ends up ending, right? That's just what we see time and time again. You just look at the data, look at history, and that's the way it plays out, okay? So that definitely played out there. And, and do, you know, I think it's important to pay attention to charts like this on Yorandini. Come take a peek at these in the future because you'll know when you're setting yourself up for trouble or you need a position maybe somewhere else, okay? And, you know, the best position would have been just to kind of sell off everything and then obviously uh, buy back now for much cheaper. But, you know, hindsight's perfect and that whole time in the market thing, it sounds great. Once you've already gone through it, it's a much harder decision to make in that moment. Moment, okay. Number five, whew, tough one, Tesla, my Tesla. So, you know, it's been an interesting many years in regards to me and Tesla, right? 2018, 2019, I was one of the only people on YouTube who would talk about the stock. There was me and there was a guy named Galileo, Hyperchange uh, was his channel. And, you know, talking positively about Tesla stock in 2018, 2019, and why I was buying the stock and, and all those things, right? Obviously, the stock blew up, and then every single YouTuber jumped on that stock in 2020, 2021, right? And everybody wanted to, you know, become a Tesla YouTuber, right? And so I obviously thrived, and, and Tesla definitely changed my financial life. It took me from being in a place where you're like, oh, he's doing really good for himself to a place where it's like, oh, man, his money's, his money's different, right? And that was great. But the bottom line was Tesla what got priced to perfection. And I called this out and I argued with a lot of folks on this. And um, a lot of folks didn't respect the angle I took in regards to Tesla. They're like, what are you becoming a Tesla bear now? You becoming Tesla Q? And it's like, no, man. It's just, at the end of the day, this is a stock I held. And I sold most of my shares. And, um, 
you know, I still hold uh, several hundred thousand dollars in Tesla, but I did sell most of my shares of Tesla in uh, late 2020 and, and uh, into, you know, uh, 2021, especially toward the end of 2021. And the reason being is, is Tesla just got valued for perfection. And when you're dealing with a stock that's valued for perfection, you're dealing with a potential big problem there, right? And in regards to Tesla, everything was just seen as is too perfect. You know, the, the valuation went to a trillion plus dollars. Obviously, we could talk about P metrics and forward P metrics and price to sales metrics and all those went off the charts, right? But the sentiment around the stock got into such a, this is such a perfect scenario, right? Where it just viewed everything as a positive, where I'm like, this is not necessarily lasting, right? And especially if you're talking about what I believe going into this year, which is the next thing we'll talk about, recession, right? Big t ticket purchases end up getting hit in a recession, right? And so although Tesla is, you know, they make tremendous products and I'm an owner of several Teslas and I love the company and all sorts of things, right? At the end of the day, big t ticket purchases get pulled back and a vehicle purchase is usually folks second biggest big ticket purchase after a house, right? And so naturally they're going to see some demand get hit there, right? And when you're already priced to perfection, you're, you're going to set your stock up for a massive move down, right? Now, just recently on this last conference call, and I listened to this conference call inside the private stock group, and I reacted to this, Elon Musk just opened the can of worms, which is starting to see demand destruction, specifically in China and Europe. And obviously in the States, we've had very low unemployment. If that starts to climb, the United States market will get hit as well in 2023. And so that's gonna erode profitability in a pretty major way. It can emerge, it can erode also margins in a major way and um, see revenue not even get close to that 50% type growth number that Tesla usually expects to hit year in year out, right? And when you were priced to perfection like this stock was in late 2021 and going into this year, you know, you, you, you're setting yourself up for, you know, a pretty epic downside there, right? Now, Tesla hasn't seen quite that downside because the numbers they've reported have been really good. But remember this backlog of vehicles that have been sold over this year, right? It's really a backlog from people that placed orders in 2021 and at the beginning of this year when it was a very different, a very different environment. The issue now moving forward is for 2023, that's orders that are going to have to come in over the next few months in coming in, obviously that will orders for 2023. And I don't think there's going to be crazy demand, not because it has anything to do with Tesla, but because 66% of Americans are in a worse financial situation than a year ago. Europe's a disaster. China's a mess. And we haven't even seen unemployment tick up. What happens if unemployment starts ticking up? More job losses start coming, especially in the tech field which is obviously a huge industry for Tesla. So that's where you get into some issues. And so that's why when I looked at Tesla, I saw a stock that I said I could have, you could very easily have two years of the stock doesn't go anywhere. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, but it doesn't go anywhere. And it's definitely a realistic possibility that this is in a, in a two to three year, maybe even frame where the stock doesn't really go anything anywhere. And it bounces anywhere from a $300 billion market cap to a trillion dollar market cap and back around and back up and down um, for the next year, even if not two years. And so that's just what I saw there. And um, that's why I didn't you know, continue to load up on that stock or anything like that into late 2021 and into this year. I know a lot of people, you know, did in, in those sorts of things, but I just, I, I definitely saw some risk in, in coming from that angle, right? And it's not that embarrassed on the company long term. It's just like, you know, you, you run the numbers, you run the projections, you see the valuation, you see the sentiment. And it's like, you know, it's not ideal. Now, with that being said, I will say this. It is possible I start buying shares of Tesla again in 2023, which would be the first time in years that it became an active buyer of Tesla stock again. And uh, it's very much a possibility. And if they start to see real demand destruction in 2023, which is a real possibility, the stock will move down a lot from here. I just do hope that everybody's prepared for that um, if that does come. It is possible that Tesla just continues to put up ridiculous growth in 23. I think it's going to be a tougher dynamic for the company, much tougher 
than 2022 numbers. Much tougher. It's like night and day tougher. And um, so I just think that's important. And, and I listened to Elon on that conference call, and he does not sound confident. I've listened to Elon for years. That's the most unconfident Elon Musk I've heard ever. Even less confident than I would say actually in the 2018, 2019 days. So there's some food for thought. And uh, obviously that, that prediction came true, right? And, um, you know, it's just in a tough spot. It'll probably remain in a tough spot. It's going to have some, some balances here and there. But uh, I think that, that that stock will continue to be in a tough spot for a bit. But for long-term buyers, you know, I think you could get some pretty darn interesting opportunities in 2023 for this stock. And maybe even potentially 2024. But 2023 is really uh, going to be an interesting year for all these companies that are big ticket purchases. There's going to be a lot of opportunities in those. I think about Tesla. I think about RH. I think about home builders. I think about even companies like the Rockets of the world. I think many of those stocks probably have still more downside ahead in 23 and um, are going to emerge with some some very interesting buying opportunities for folks that want to go long different different let's call it big ticket purchase items um, at cheaper cheaper valuations. So 2023 and even I think part of 2024 will be that sort of opportunity there. Okay. Um, sixth thing I was right about is recession. So back in January, when most folks weren't actually talking about recession, I was planning for a recession, right? The only thing I didn't do is sell out all my stocks, which hindsight would have been perfect. I should have sold out all my stocks. I would have sold myself probably $3 million, to be honest. Um, but that whole time in the market game, it's a, it's a losing game over time. We all know that, right? But I, I put out that video on preparing for recession and looked at all my businesses and everything I was up to and um, started kind of planning things and getting things in motion, right? And that included a lot of hard decisions, including shutting down the Hungry Bowl app, which was you know something I definitely invested a lot of money and time in into and uh that was a big decision there and just many other various things right and how to cut people and expenses and a lot of things that are just painful and suck to have to go through that and i did that and i got out in front of that before everybody including even before the biggest companies in the world right and now all of a sudden you're hearing about all the big tech companies cutting way back on hiring and even starting to cut a lot of positions even companies like tesla did that recently and um you know, I was just out in front of that before everybody else started to feel that pain. I, I kind of understood what was likely coming, right? And, um, you know, technically, the government will tell you that we're not in recession. But let's just think about this logically. Two quarters of negative GDP. In, in Economics 101, they teach you that's a recession. We had that, okay? Consumer confidence, the lowest we've ever seen in the history of consumer confidence. Hmm. Smells like recession. Investor confidence, that's the lowest we've seen just about in history as well. Outside of one week in the great financial crisis. Hmm. Smells like recession. Everybody being extremely concerned about the future of the economy over the next year. Hmm. Smells like recession. Company earnings, many of them deteriorating in a massive way. Margins getting hit in a massive way. Hmm. Smells like recession. Every single thing lines up except for unemployment. That's the one thing. We haven't had, right? And so that's the one thing they say, well, that's, that. see, we don't have a recession. And it's like, have you seen how many companies' revenues are trending down or aren't even growing or their earnings are down considerably? And even including great companies. Wasn't it Nike that just reported EPS was down something like 20% year over year? Nike? Nike? You know, FedEx, look at their warning. So when you add up all those things, it's like, okay, the government tells us it's not recession, but gosh, everything in the data says recession. Recession, recession, right? So I will take credit and I will say I was right about that, even though the government will tell me I was wrong. At the end of the day, the numbers are proof. The numbers are proof, okay? Hope you guys enjoyed this as always. I think there's always things you can learn from things you got right, things you got wrong in the stock market. And as investors in the market, you know, you got always you got to always look back at things and say, okay, what did I get right in this situation? What did I get wrong? And why was I wrong or why was I right in that situation? So, yeah, I appreciate each and every one of you that subscribe to the channel and that, you know, show up for the videos. Much love as always. And uh, back to the res regularly scheduled content tomorrow. Well, front cash account. Make sure you check that out. That will be pinned comment down there. Take advantage of that. That is absolutely massive. Once again, that is pinned comment down there to um, set it up. Okay. Much love as always and have a great day.